So what a pleasure it is to be here and talk about space with you all uh, in, in such a big space. <laughs> uh, so what we're going to talk about is uh, we look for NASA and JPL, look for the big answers. Uh, we're going to look for it in new ways. We now have new technologies coming and new workforce, new partnerships, and it's going to be an exciting time. Uh, these are the questions that affect humanity. And yes, this is a cloud computing conference, so I will tie in cloud computing into this. Uh, but first of all, uh, if you remember where you were four years ago, I certainly do, uh, it was an exciting time where we're going to attempt a crazy engineering trick. We're going to land a 2,000-pound rover 150 million miles away, uh, all by itself, from thousands of kilometers per second to standstill in seven terrifying minutes. Uh, what we did, we tried something new. We tried AWS to give you all the pictures at the same time as we saw them. And let's see what happened, and where were you when Curiosity landed on Mars? I went up on the tree. The vehicle reports entry interface. At this time, it'll begin pressurizing the propulsion system to increase the thrust of the system. Uh, it'll use that for all the maneuvering in the atmosphere we're about to do. Touchdown confirmed. We're safe on Mars. So these answers really matter. And you have to think about the people who were in the room. Their careers hinged on this. They've been working at it for years and years and years. And it was the generation that, when we grew up, we looked into the heavens and we saw pictures. Uh, we didn't really know what they were, but they were interesting. Then came the space race, and we were transfixed. We were fixed in front of the TV. We were observing people on the surface of the moon. It was completely amazing. Now, the next generation, they're not going to be happy with just observing. They're not going to be happy with just saying, can we get there? They're going to expect it to happen. They have much more knowledge. They have smartphones with NASA and JPL apps. And uh, they will be, expect to be amazed by what they find, not if they find it. They don't want to just participate. They, they don't want to just observe. They want to participate. Uh, and they want to be part of it, whether they're on the surface, as my personal heroes when I grew up were astronauts. They will want to participate uh, from using augmented reality or uh, using their smartphones or on the surface as astronauts. So it's no longer about a space race between countries. It's a race for humanity into space. I want to take you on a journey of these big questions of discovering our universe. So first of all, how can we help protect Mother Earth? So we're going to go into detail. That's one of the big questions. Then we'll go deeper into the universe, and we'll ask, is there life in space? Then we're going to finish on my personal favorite, Mars, and see, is there or was there ever life on Mars? So those are the big questions, and we're going to look for it in new ways. So let's talk about infrastructure. James talked about network. It's an awesome network, but it's ground-based. Our network is in space. And what we have is we have the deep space network that has antennas that are strategically placed so as the Earth spins. Uh, we can always hear and, and communicate with our spacecraft. We have about 30 spacecraft uh, in our solar system and beyond, and instruments uh, that we track every day for NASA and for other uh, industry. So what's going on right now? Well, if you were to whip out your smartphone, you could find out right now what's happening. So that's a change. Everybody can participate. And how can we get better results? How can we improve this infrastructure? Well, certainly, more data and more compute power is going to help us answer these big questions. How much data? Uh, this is the uh, Surface Moisture Active Passive and uh, Ocean Carbon Observatory. They're satellites that, or spacecraft that circle the Earth. And they help protect Mother Earth by looking for uh, ice, carbon dioxide, water. And they collect a terabyte per day. That's a lot of data. I want to go into each of those questions a little bit deeper. So we're sending out two new missions. These are called SWAT and NISAR. They are doing the same thing. They're going to circle the Earth. 
and they're going to look for, they're going to bounce radar off of the ground, and they're going to bounce it and look for the water table. The water table in oceans, in rivers, in the ice sheet, even down to reservoirs. So they will collect a lot of data. How much data? They're 100 times bigger than the other two. How much data is that? It's 100 terabytes per day, 100 gigabits per second, all the time. Much too big for our data centers. So what are we going to do? We're going to use cloud computing. And it's not just about the infrastructure. When we had orbiting carbon observatory, we discovered something called spot market. And you're all going, duh, <laughs> I know about the spot market. For us, it was a revolution. Because we discovered we could all of a sudden compute at a fraction of uh, the dollar, pennies on the dollar. So that is now part of our operational way of working. So it is not just the infrastructure, but it's how we work. So that's going to help farmers. It's going to help predict us predict floods, droughts, city planners. It'll help everybody. That's one of the big questions. Now, how else could we help protect Mother Earth? What if a big asteroid was about to hit us? Uh, we found 1,600 uh, Earth, uh, near-Earth asteroids in just uh, recently. And what if a close on were to come close? How would we change it? Well, how do we move it? Well, we don't know. <laughs> we're about to figure it out. So we're going to send out, NASA and JPL is sending out something called the Asteroid Redirect Mission. And the idea is to, very straightforward, go find an asteroid about 400 meters, uh, go pick up a boulder, a multi-ton boulder from that, and then bring it in orbit around the moon, where astro astronauts can then come and mine it, and then learn how to tractor beam it and redirect it. Piece of cake, right? A few challenges. Uh, an asteroid has very low gravity, so you're likely to bounce off before you can even pick up the boulder. The boulder might be stuck, uh, and how are you going to get there? We don't have enough propulsion to get there. So that's an interesting one. The solar electric propulsion is an idea that the NASA and JPL engineers came up with. And what they're going to do is use uh, xenon gas to essentially use photons to push the spacecraft forward. It's you're going to use one-tenth the amount of uh, fuel. It's going to have three times more power and two times more efficient. Uh, you can then pair them. And you can then, if you can pair enough of them, each one will generate about 50 kilowatts of power. Pair enough of them to 300 kilowatts, and you can get humans to Mars and back. And that's really the key. So what has cloud got to do with this? Well, it has everything to do with this. We decided to do it differently and actually use cloud computing to start the project. So it started in the cloud. Uh, now we're partnering much more easily. We're pivoting just like a startup would. And by partnering with industry, uh, who will build a lot of this, uh, it's going to be an amazing change. Another big question is, where could we find life? And I'm sure all of you know what this is, right? Maybe not. But for those who don't know, it's Europa. Europa is a moon of Jupiter. And it's, well, it's it interesting. What do you need for life? You need energy and you need water. Europa has both. In fact, it has two times the amount of water that Earth does. And what we can see is if you drill down on the surface a little bit, uh, you notice something interesting. There are no craters. Because it's a giant ice sheet. It's about 10 miles thick, but it flows like the Arctic Ocean does. So we have water and we have energy. Now, 10 miles thick, that's a bit of a problem. But there are lakes inside of that ice sheet that we think is one of the more likely places to house life. So we're going to send an orbiter to orbit Europa. It's about 400 million miles away. And it's going to find the landing spot. Then it's going to land in all of these uh, ice crevices. And can you imagine how much data and simulation that will take? Because it has to be completely automated. Without cloud computing, there's no way we could do it. And we're using model-based engineering and other interesting goodies. And it's all started in the cloud. So that all of these things, by the way, are happening in the next five to 10 years. Now, if we one day needed to export humanity, would we have a place to go? Could we find Earth 2.0? So there's something called extrasolar planets, or exoplanets. And they are planets that circle their Earth, just their sun, sorry, just like we circle our Earth. 
And how do you find them? You look through a pinhole at the same spot in the sky for a very long time. And then you notice that there is changes in the energy that you get. That is perhaps a, a planet orbiting its sun or a wobble in the, uh, the orbit of the planet itself from the star near it. When you do that, we've found so far uh, 3,000 confirmed exoplanets in just a few years, 2,400 unconfirmed. But of those, are any of them Earth-like? Could we actually live there? So far, we found 21. Uh, 21 by just looking through this pinhole in just a few years. Problem is, they're a little far away. The closest is four light years away. How far is four light years? It would take 1,000 years to get there with current propulsion. So what if you were to send a nanosatellite? You could actually get there in 20 years. Uh, science fiction? So was landing 2,000 pounds on Mars just a few years ago. Uh, innovation is moving much faster. The James Webb Telescope is going to go from pinhole to much larger aperture. The science, the simulation, the math is going to require hundreds of thousands of servers to do this. And, but we don't have to own them anymore. So cloud computing is a really, really big deal for us. That was a near of an exoplanet. Now, let's finish on Mars. Uh, we have not yet had humans on Mars. There's only been one, to my knowledge, and uh, Matt Damon. <laughs> and he came back, so that was good. Uh, for us to send more people, we want to prepare for it. Now, Curiosity landed four years ago, and it was an amazing thing. And like any teenager would do, it took a selfie. So it took its giant robot arms, and it spun around, and it took a selfie to make sure we're healthy. What have we found so far? This is a picture from Mars, so welcome. What does it look like? Has anybody been to California's Death Valley? Death Valley looks just like this, because in fact it was formed by flowing waters, both of them were, uh, and Earth uh, and Mars had the same conditions for life about four billion years ago. Here's another picture. It's uh, the Namib dune on Mars. Again, it could be a sand dune on Death Valley. So we found flowing water, but we haven't found the smoking, and we found conditions for life. We haven't found the smoking gun. We haven't found life. So JPL and NASA are going back. We're going to send uh, a new spacecraft, Mars uh, 2020, named for now, to see if we can uh, see the signs of life and pave the way for humans. The last time we had 20 minutes, so it's amazing. You, you, it's uh, you know, 150 million miles away. You only have 20 minutes to figure out what the rover is going to do the next day. Uh, 20 minutes means that sometimes you miss a day. The rover stays parked. That's not a really good use of time. But if we could speed that up to five minutes, we wouldn't miss a day. How do you do that? Cloud computing. So immense compute power, very fast, and use some machine learning to augment it. So we've gone now, and that's what we're going to do. So Mars, so cloud computing has gone from being a very nice to have and in engaging you all with the pictures to something mission critical every single day. Now, what will this spacecraft look like? Or rover, rather. So if you look at it, uh, it's going to have some changes. It will have new wheels, uh, stronger and skinnier and deeper grooves so it can climb uh, taller hills. It'll have a microphone so we can hear the sounds of Mars. Uh, it'll be able to drill and store the rocks for future astronauts to come and pick it up, or future missions, uh, even unmanned missions. And it's going to be the first test of actually producing oxygen on Mars to prepare for next Matt Damon that comes up there and needs some help. It's also going to have some new landing techniques. The other thing we're looking at is uh, creating a scout, a helicopter on Mars. Why not? The may not be on this mission, but how could you fly a helicopter at 100,000 feet? We have any helicopters here? Uh, no. But we've shown that in our lab we could do it by using counter rotating blades, so it's possible. And that could be a scout to peek over the hill and see what's coming next. These look remarkably like toys, and that's not a bad thing. On the contrary, it's speeding up how we work, how we test, how we infuse. And if you saw BB 8, this is BB-8, a toy, seeing our toy rover. 
Uh, the little guy there is a 3D printed rover for $3 on the desktop 3D printer. And we found that it could climb glass. And if it could climb glass in our lab, could it do it on the space station? So we put it in the Vomit Comet, and it's a zero gravity, and you can see it's climbing fine, uh, and it worked. So this is an idea of going from a crazy little toy idea to actual something on the space station in just a few months. It's unheard of speed. So this is Meet Rovi. Rovi is an uh, outreach rover. It's a miniature copy of the Mars uh, exploration rover. And it's built from Arduinos, Raspberry Pis, uh, open software, and Amazon's IoT and Lambda. Tomorrow at the IoT uh, State of the Union, we're going to drive it on stage, I hope. <laughs> I hope it works. Uh, and you can use your joystick to drive it, but that's so yesterday. You're going to be able to drive it with Alexa, so you can talk to it. Uh, and you'll see how that works. And you can ask it questions about Mars, and it'll answer. And some other goodies that you'll find out tomorrow. If you don't have a robot, uh, you can just use Alexa. So today we're announcing that tomorrow you'll be able to use you know, Amazon Dots, <laughs> your Amazon Echoes, and you can ask questions about Mars. This is all about ex exploring and getting crowdsourcing and getting people to understand and care about Mars and ask new questions. Uh, by the way, the uh, rover is a blueprint that everybody can have and you can build your own. And it's for schools, universities, and uh, museums or your home. So with this, the idea is that we're all going to be the future explorers. The things that you do, the amazing compute power. The hackathon uh, last night was just amazing. From zero to... Uh, liftoff in just one day, and it all auto-scaled, it was serverless, and it was one of the most amazing things I've ever seen. That's what you're all going to help us do. And your children are the ones that will one day walk on Mars, uh, whether it is virtually through augmented reality or physically as astronauts. But uh, please engage with us. There are many NASA and JPL people in the audience. And find us during the conference or afterwards. And let's help answer these big questions for humanity together. And thank you very much for listening.